You good? Audio's up, video's up, web is up, streaming is up. Everybody's good? Okay, great. Fantastic. I apologize for the delay, everybody. Um, we had some technical difficulties, and Dr. LaSouza has a presentation that required the projector to be working. Um, so thank you for your patience. I appreciate that. So real quick, just the housekeeping items. In accordance with the requirements of the Open Public Meeting Act, Chapter 231, PL 1975 announcement, I wish to announce that the New Jersey Open Public Meetings Law was enacted to ensure the right of the public to have advance notice of and to attend meetings of the public body at which any business affecting their interest is discussed or acted upon. In accordance with the provisions of this act, the school district, school districts of the Chatham has caused notice of this meeting to be posted in the date, time, place. They are posted in the board administrative offices, sent to the clerks of the Chatham Borough, the Chatham Township, the Library of the Chathams, the Chatham Courier, the Daily Record, the Star Ledger, and the TAP. Uh, Peter, would you mind taking attendance? Sure. Ms. Ciccarelli? Here. Ms. Clark? Here. Mr. Del Sandro? Here. Ms. Kenny? Ms. Ms. Kenny? Oh, no. here. Oh. Ms. Ross? Here. Mr. Ryan? Here. Mr. Smith? Here. Dr. Zhang? Here. And Ms. Weber? Here. Nine President of the Council. Great. Thank you. If you're able, please stand and join us for the Pledge of Allegiance. The flower, flat flower. The flag is right behind Dr. Lasusa. I pledge allegiance, allegiance to, the to the flag of the United, United States, States of America, America and to the and republic, republic for which it stands, which it stands one, nation, one nation under God, under God indivisible, indivisible, with liberty, with liberty and, and justice for all. For all. Excellent. Uh, thank you again for your patience. I do. I do not want to have any president's comments right now because I want to get right to Dr. Lasusa's report. Um, again, this is the it's September 19th meeting. Um, welcome back, everybody. This is our first meeting after school opened. Um, our last meeting was a few days right before it began, so I'm sure Dr. Lasus has some great updates, and I'm going to pass it directly over to you, Mike, for to take away. Thank you, Ms. Weber. Um, like you said, uh, back to school has we're, we're in we're in the full throes of the school year. Back back to school has gone well. I think the students, for the most part, transitioned back into the buildings uh, very well, even though we started a little bit early. Ditto our staff. Um, we had a warm first week, and um, unfortunately here at the high school where we have about 10 uh, univentilators being replaced, uh, the, the uh, systems hadn't arrived yet. They're, we're still waiting on them, as a matter of fact, so those rooms were warm. That was probably um, the biggest challenge we faced in the initial uh, coming back to school. Um, but apart from that, our transportation systems have gone well with the new schedules. Uh, our middle school schedule, our teachers there have, have moved into that change quite well as well. We start start strong testing tomorrow, and uh, at least at the high school we do, and we'll be taking care of that requirement uh, over the next two weeks. Uh, I noticed someone in the audience want to give a special shout out to Captain Penn. Uh, he was a first responder on 9-11, and he had the graciousness and the generosity to come into our schools, both Chatham Middle School and Chatham High School, to talk with students about what it was like to respond. He was at Ground Zero uh, working through the rubble, and um, I know I got incredible feedback about his talk with students. Uh, including one uh, young lady at the middle school who approached him in tears afterward and told him basically that she was having a rough time as of late, but that he um, reinstilled her belief in uh, people and humanity. So I want to thank Bob Penn, who's in the audience. Maybe you can give a wave, Bob. Thank you. Uh, and I think um, other than that, again, big picture, uh, we've gotten off to a good solid four weeks of school so far. Uh, the second item under my agenda is just a status on schools right now, uh, including an enrollment update, um, and then a potential proposal to consider as a board and as a, as a wider community. So for that, I would ask, and we were delayed in starting the meeting because we had some technical difficulties, but if the board can um, head down into the audience, into the seats, I'll go through my presentation as quickly as I can.
All right, so bear with me. We um, are going to try to advance the slides from afar. And if we run into any problems, then we'll have to do them manually, and it'll be a little bit uh, clunkier. But, um, you know, when the beginning of the year comes, we always, you know, think about where we're headed. Over the summer, we have a time to reflect. Uh, we've discussed a number of challenges that we're facing as a district from time to time. They include the uh, educator shortage that every school district is confronting right now. Uh, they include costs and inflation and, of course, our annual budget process. Uh, and so I'm going to kind of touch on two other issues that we have discussed from time to time at board meetings and then uh, try to establish a greater context and a consideration for how we might move forward as a district uh, over the next five to 10 years. So educators sometimes like to speak about essential questions. That's what frames our curriculum. And my essential question for this presentation is whether it's time for us as a school district to consider a change in the way that our school schools as grade levels uh, are configured. And of course, my answer to this question is yes. This is something we should at least consider at the current time. And I'm going to try to explain uh, why I think it's time to do that. Uh, there'll be four basic uh, parts to this presentation. First, I'm just going to give a snapshot of two challenges that we've spoken about from time to time. But I'm going to, I'm going to go into them just a little bit further than usual. I'm going to give a quick history and rundown of the school district of the Chathams as we know it. I'm going to look at current enrollment trends over the course of the history of the school district, and then I'll get to the potential proposal. Uh, so two of the needs that have come up at board meetings, if you've been watching board meetings over the years, are these. Uh, and you know, we, we haven't necessarily spent a great deal of time dwelling on them, uh, because to a certain degree, we feel like they're out of our control a little bit. Um, but I want to kind of touch on them right here because they really are and have become something that we need to pay closer attention to as we're moving forward as it relates to the schools. So first of all, I know there's a range of opinions about full day kindergarten. Whenever it comes up, we hear impassioned pleas to find a way to find, uh, to, to fund and manage and, and introduce full day kindergarten for all students. We have other folks who think uh, you know what, my children moved through the schools, they were in a half-day program, half-day program is fine. Um, the simple fact is that seven, eight, nine years ago when we were going through our referendum proposals, one of which failed, one of which was successful, uh, about 18% of school districts in New Jersey offered a half-day program. That number has dramatically dropped to about 5%. There are very, very few school districts left in the state of New Jersey uh, that don't run a full-day kindergarten program. And the reason for that is that a full-day kindergarten program is superior to a half-day full-day uh, half kindergarten program. And not having a full-day program leads to inequities right as students begin uh, their educational career. Lack of a full-day program is definitely the um, largest, the, the, the single biggest weakness instructionally in our school district right now. Uh, in Morris County, there's only one other district that operates elementary schools that does not have full day kindergarten at present. And every single one of our neighbors, Milburn, Madison, Livingston, Florham Park, Summit, they all have full day kindergarten programs. The only one on this list that, uh, that, that the only one that isn't on the list up there in the second bullet is New Providence. New Providence has announced that next year they will have full day kindergarten. So the fact that all of our neighbors, everyone in Morris County but one, operates a full day kindergarten and we don't is a definite competitive disadvantage uh, when it comes to prospective home buyers, when it comes to starting off uh, the educational program on solid footing. Um, it's, a def it's, an, it's an issue for us that we really should try to do everything we can uh, to rectify. In terms of enrollment, I'm going to delve into enrollment much more deeply in a minute, but uh, just big picture, as we know, we've been talking about this, uh, enrollment has declined. Uh, so going back to our demographic report from 2018, and we're about to freshen that up by the end of the calendar year, um, demographic reports are based on birth rates. In the year 2004, uh, 312 kids were born between the two Chathams. 
Uh, and last year, uh, sorry, 2016, uh, it was half that number. I take the, the year 20, 2004 because those were the kids who just graduated in June. We graduated 330 kids in June. Uh, and sure enough, even though we picked up a few, that uh, translates into the birth rates that we saw. And 2016 represents our current first graders. So we have uh, 230 or so first graders, uh, roughly 240 maybe. Uh, we've picked up some since 2016, but you can see the difference between the outgoing class of 2022 and then this year's current first graders. So enrollment has declined, but we're now at a point where we have a lot of housing units coming up in both municipalities. Uh, by my count, and I'm not um, you know, an expert in this, I don't know, you know all the details, but from what I can see and pick up you know, from reading, uh, there are roughly 400 units that will be coming online in the next couple of years. So that's happening right as our enrollment likely will start to increase again. After the low birth rate years, at least there's a possibility that we're going to end up um, swinging back in the other direction because these things tend to be cyclical. So that leaves us in a place where it's possible enrollment might increase. It's also possible that the demographers that have looked at these housing units will be accurate and we won't get too many students who come out of them. But the enrollment, while maybe it won't increase overall, could shift. And if the enrollment shifts, then that could lead to a rezoning of our elementary neighborhoods. So we've talked about this probably going 10 years now in, in various board meetings at different points. Uh, but if there's an imbalance of students coming to Washington Avenue School, as an example, and we have fewer students in Milton Avenue School, for example, that could cause a redrawing of the boundaries so that we can maintain balance between the two schools and commensurate class sizes and so forth. So those two challenges are on the horizon, if you will. And some of what we should be thinking about, I think, as we're beginning a new year, as we're emerging from the pandemic, as, as things are, you know, as we, as we can see ahead of us, is how we can address the instructional weakness of the lack of full-day kindergarten alongside uh, guarding against any disruptions we might have due to uh, shifts in housing or shifts in enrollment. But just a quick trip down memory lane to uh, establish some context for the school district. We're celebrating essentially our 35th anniversary this year uh, because our school district was born uh, in the year uh, 1986 via referendum put forward to the residents of Chatham Borough School District and Chatham Township School District. So I'm just gonna go really quickly, tell you how we got to where we are today. Uh, Chatham Township was formed in 1806. It included President Day, Madison, and Florham Park, and Chatham Borough. And by the end of the 19th century, several of those municipalities decided to secede. They weren't municipalities at the time. Of course, they were part of Chatham Township. Uh, but in this period in New Jersey, uh, invariably, uh, communities seceded for one of three reasons. There was the introduction of Macadam Roads, and there were fights over who would pay the taxes to provide for Macadam Roads. Uh, that's, in fact, one of the causes of the Chatham Borough secession. Uh, the second was fights over the same kind of issue, but with water treatment and uh, sewer management and that sort of thing. And then the third was control over public schools. So you see a lot of formation of boroughs in particular because there were advantages to borough governments at this time, uh, especially in the 1880s and 1890s. So once the borough split off from the township, uh, then you had two different school districts. You had Chatham Borough School District and Chatham Township School District. Um, and school facilities, of course, were kind of sparse at this time. Uh, we all know uh, the, the beautiful building that um, houses the current Chatham Borough municip Municipal Offices. That was at Fairmount, built in 1911. Lum Avenue, which is now ECLC, was built in 1922. And Chatham Township, uh, if you go by Southern Boulevard School and look up where the paint is kind of peeling up on the facade, it says Chatham Township Public School. That was the public school in Chatham Township. Uh, and those were all built um, prior to World War II in the early part of the 20th century. 
And over this time, uh, it's also worth just kind of remembering that Chatham Borough was much larger than Chatham Township. Chatham Borough was more developed and Chatham Township was more rural. Uh, and that continued right through the majority of the 20th century. Uh, even as of 1960, almost twice as many people lived in the borough and the township. So they operated as separate school districts with the caveat that Chatham Borough, uh, Chatham Township rather, sent on a tuition basis its high school students to Chatham Borough because that uh, high school was the only game in town. And many students actually finished their education by sixth or eighth grade. Not all students went on to high school. Uh, and a lot of students attended on a, a split schedule or a part-time basis uh, because there, there wasn't enough room um, to service all of the students at the same time. Then we hit World War II and the quintessential baby boom and the explosion in population. And that's when we have the building of a lot of the schools in the district today, including the one we're standing in. Uh, so in the borough, Milton Avenue was the first to come on in 1949. Uh, Washington Avenue schools followed shortly thereafter. And Chatham Borough built a high school, which is our current middle school in 1957, uh, at the site of some old greenhouses. In the township, Lafayette Avenue school, school was the first of the, the modern facilities to come on in 1954. Um, and again, the borough continued to send, uh, sorry, the township continued to send students on a tuition basis to the borough for high school until 1962 when the current high school came online. And then a bunch of years later in 1972, Mountain View opened, which is where uh, Chatham Township Municipal Offices are today. So even though there was a lot of construction around the middle of the 20th century, almost immediately after the construction, there were calls to merge the two school districts. And the primary uh, rationale for doing so, the primary argument was that uh, the communities together could offer a more robust program, particularly at the high school with advanced level courses. Uh, however, because enrollment was increasing at the time, uh, those kinds of recommendations didn't really get uh, very far. Uh, but still, between 1969 and 1986, there were ongoing calls and studies and recommendations uh, from elected officials in both municipalities and on both boards of education uh, to consolidate the two districts. And finally, in uh, 1986, in June, uh, there was a comprehensive analysis done. This time, enrollment was declining, and the recommendation to merge the two uh, school districts took root, and that's how we came to uh, a merged district in November of 1986. Before the vote to consolidate the schools, uh, this is what the schools looked like. So Chatham Borough on your left had uh, two elementary schools. They housed students in grades K through four. Chatham Middle School was a four uh, grade school building, uh, grades five through eight. And then there was Chatham High School, grades nine through 12, of course. Chatham Township had K-5 buildings, not K-4 buildings, uh, a middle school at Lafayette Avenue with uh, grades six through eight, and then the current high school, 912. After the vote, this is how the uh, folks chose to organize the district. They went with the K-4 approach at the three elementary schools, grades five through eight, again, at the middle school. Uh, and then 912 at the high school. Lafayette Avenue School actually served for one year as an eighth grade only building, and then it was leased out to the Morris Union Jointure Commission for four years. The Morris Union Jointure Commission is a special education um, consortium. Chatham was one of the founding uh, members with, I think, eight or nine other districts. Uh, so that space was utilized for a period of time by MUJC. And then, of course, uh, once some renovations took place, Lafayette School came back online, and then we had, in 1995, the current configuration of our schools that you all are familiar with today. So, kind of overlaying our enrollment over that period of time since the inception of the school district, uh, big picture enrollment looks like this. When the school district was born back in 1988-89, we had just over 2,000 students. That enrollment doubled, as you can see, uh, through around 2010. There was this 20-year period of intense, intense growth. Uh, and then since 2016 or so, 
uh, our enrollment has gradually started to uh, decline. Um, this shows just the past 15 years, and I put an orange dotted line here that kind of represents what the enrollment is when we have roughly 300 students per grade level, which had been our normal for quite a period of time. So with 300 students in grades K through 12, you get to 3,900 kids, uh, plus we have a few uh, preschoolers. Uh, but that orange line is kind of where the 300 normal uh, lies. And you can see that we, in the last year or two, uh, are below that line, and that's a place we haven't been since 2008-9. Again, uh, before I had the, uh, the year 2004 listed up here, now I have 2005 because 2005 is our current seniors. At least most of our current seniors were born in 2005, and again, 2016 is our first grade. So if you think about the number of children being born, you think about the norm of 300. And if you were to conceptualize kind of what our enrollment looks like with a 300 baseline, you can see grade 12 uh, where there were 300 some odd students or kids born in Chatham in 2005. And those are the kids who are now graduating. That's our largest class, just shy of 340 students. And you can see what happens as you track down the line and grades you know, one through four, um, we're well below now um, 300 students. So the way that looks inside the schools over the past uh, 10 years or so uh, is like this. This is our pre-K through three enrollment. Um, all three buildings, you know, track down. Total pre-K th three enrollment, meaning the cumulative of all three buildings also continues or has continued to track down following the, the birth rates and the kids coming in. Um, and so just a couple of, of notes. So first of all, as our enrollment has declined uh, at the pre-K through three level, what we have done is we have prioritized the uh, establishment of full day kindergarten. And we've done that through a lottery basis where we put out an announcement in the spring um, we tell parents that if they'd like to be considered for the lottery, they may submit their application. The tuition charge is $7,000. And then we try to offer as many seats in full day kindergarten as we can. So a couple of years back when we first did this, we, we offered two sections. Uh, pandemic gave us a little bit of a speed bump. And now this year we're at four sections of full day kindergarten with 80 students total. The other thing we've been doing as we have had fewer students attending the schools is that we've been expanding the offerings in special education programming so that we can keep more students in the least restrictive environment in their home schools, at least in their home district. Uh, so we have expanded full day kindergarten on a tuition basis and we have broadened what we do in special education programming to service more students in district. Uh, and both of those um, actions have taken up classrooms. So if you walk through our pre-K through three buildings, there are no empty classrooms. Every single class is occupied. Every single class is full. Uh, but what's new is that we have full day sections in place where we didn't before. And we have a greater diversity of special education programming to meet the needs of a broader range of students. At Lafayette, that's pre-K through three that I just sort of went through. Lafayette, we just see a steady decline. Um, I've projected out a couple of years based on the current students in the district in grades one, two, and three to give you an idea of where Lafayette is headed. Uh, but you can see our peak at Lafayette was 714 kids uh, about eight years ago or so. Um, we're heading down uh, below 500. We're not below 500 yet, but we'll be below 500 uh, in a couple of years. So Lafayette's in decline. Middle school is the same. Um, middle school, we peaked at just shy of uh, 1,100 kids. And now we're steadily heading down. We're in the 800s and we'll continue to decline as we move forward. Again, projecting out based on the students who are currently in the district right now. Just to give some perspective there, uh, peak enrollment at the middle school, uh, like I said, was just shy of 1,100. And currently in grades one, two, and three, if you project forward uh, five years, uh, the enrollment at the middle school would be 723. Now again, that's 
not considering that some students may move in, some students may exit. I'm sure the exact number won't be 723 in five years, but the number is also not going to be anywhere near uh, 1093. High school enrollment hasn't yet declined because in part we still have the remnants of the bubble passing through. You saw that, that class of 12th graders with 340 students just about. Um, and the other students in grades 9, 10, and 11 um, also are uh, around the 300 range. So the high school hasn't yet seen a, a big decline in enrollment, uh, but eventually it will a few years out once the smaller grade levels uh, begin to hit the high school. So um, kind of putting all that together, uh, several of the challenges that we face on, a, on an annual basis is trying to allocate space in the elementary buildings. We have these meetings every year with the principals and Dr. Sortino and others, and we try to figure out how much space do we have to offer full day kindergarten, how much space do we have to house special education programming, preschool classrooms, where do we put them? Um, and it's just a, a revolving uh, wheel of hitting the same challenges. At some point, enrollment is going to start to tick back up. It might be because there's so much new housing coming online. It might simply be because the birth rates They've gone down, and eventually they'll probably come back up. Uh, but at some point, enrollment is going to change from dropping to stabilizing to then increasing again. And when that happens, we're going to have um, some, some struggle ahead of us because we are allocating the rooms that we used to use for uh, our conventional programs. We've been allocating them for special education programming and for full day kindergarten. So we will have to dismantle those programs if we need to recapture space, um, assuming that we don't just move to much larger class sizes, which um, we probably don't want to do. So the consideration that I uh, am proffering here is to think about changing the grade level configurations of the schools. Um, and specifically, the consideration would be to think about uh, taking our three elementary buildings and converting them to K through two school buildings, changing Lafayette from a four or five school to a three four school, bringing the middle school back to being a five through eight building, which it was uh, both before the merger and for about five years after the merger leaving the high school untouched, of course, but changing up the grade levels in uh, all of the other schools. And again, when I say this is a consideration, what, I'm, what I want to emphasize is this is something to explore and evaluate. Uh, this isn't you know, some automatic uh, foregone conclusion. This would take a lot of analysis, a lot of work, a lot of planning. It could be that this is a dead end street and it doesn't go anywhere and it's impossible, or it could be that this consideration leads us to being able to uh, have a stronger school district uh, overall. I've kind of mentioned most of this, but I'll, I'll restate it. Um, doing this would provide us more stability than we've had in our programs, particularly at the uh, pre-K through three buildings. It would enable us to offer full day kindergarten to all students because we'd be removing grade three from the pre-K through three buildings and that would free up enough space in every school to offer full day kindergarten. We can stabilize and potentially if we need to redistribute special education programming, uh, but we would have more flexibility to meet the needs of our special education learners. And it would guard against the need to rezone the elementary school neighborhoods. Right now, the elementary schools are, like I said, full. They're operating at full capacity because of the various types of programs that we have uh, operating in them. If we had a surge in enrollment in any one place, whether it was Southern Boulevard or it was Washington or Milton, uh, we would be able to withstand that without rezoning all of the neighborhoods if we removed one grade level from each of the pre-K three through three schools. And that grade level would be third grade again. Lafayette would remain a two-grade 
school like it is now, except instead of grades four and five, we'd have grades three and four. Um, we could consider all kinds of scheduling and programming uh, opportunities if we were to move in this direction, um, but Lafayette wouldn't gain a grade level. CMS is the place that would gain the, gra <laughs> gain the grade level. Um, interestingly, New Jersey certifications uh, for the, the state of New Jersey issue certifications on a five through eight basis. Um, we also would have to uh, look at opportunities on how we schedule kids, how we organize the building. There would be plenty of challenges, which I'll get to in a second, but we could have opportunities to provide additional programming to middle school students, uh, in particular in the new design and technology labs, which we just built a few years ago. Um, CMS, just to, to kind of restate this, currently it's the school with the greatest amount of space. Um, it had been a four grade school. Again, the district was much smaller at the time, but we're heading back toward that neighborhood of total enrollment um, at the middle school, just based on the kids who are currently registered in the district. Um, and since the enrollment peak uh, six years ago, we've added space in the middle school. So we have a little bit more flexibility in the middle school than we would have, let's just say, for example, at Lafayette Avenue School. CHS would, would remain status quo. Um, so big picture, potentially, possibly, um, the best way to manage our space and uh, improve what we currently do might be to consider uh, a realignment of our grade levels and adding a grade level to the middle school. A couple of quick notes, K through two is pretty common. There are no shortage of K through two schools in New Jersey. Uh, five through eight is also quite common, uh, and there's no shortage of five through eight middle schools nearby that we could visit, that we could talk to, uh, including some excellent schools, as you can see on this list. So it's not like this is uh, an unprecedented type of structure. Some of the concerns and the challenges, just to speak to them immediately, but they, they of course, any one of them could be an hour-long presentation. Um, this would cause uh, a significant transfer of staff members, particularly in grades three and five, um, and we'd have to look at their certifications and, and other, you know, other details. Transportation is always a concern. Uh, we likely would need to add a bus route or two, or maybe more, um, but the more students you have in one grade level in one school, the more efficiently you can run um, your scheduling. So like, Lafayette Avenue School, for example, because all of the fourth and all of the fifth graders are at Lafayette Avenue School, our most balanced class sizes are at Lafayette Avenue School. That's not true of the K-3 schools right now uh, because all three of them, uh, of course, are running grades one and grade two and grade three. So we'd probably gain some efficiencies that would potentially offset uh, costs that would be associated with transportation or other things. We'd have to talk an awful lot about grade five uh, and transitioning them to a middle school, even though, like I just said, there are plenty of middle schools around with grade five. We haven't had our grade five in our middle school, so we'd have to sort of determine what is the best approach, uh, best place to house them, best schedule, so on and so forth. We don't really have a playground at the middle school. Uh, we do have some, uh, you know, uh, basketball courts at the borough just uh, refinished that look beautiful, um, but we might have to think about how we would do recess and scheduling and the rest of it. Uh, if we were to go forward with this, again I say if, that first year of transition, all of Lafayette Avenue School, grades four and five, would leave at the same time together and they would go into the middle school and there'd be two additional or two new grade levels in the middle school. Uh, our collective bargaining agreements have to be uh, scrutinized to make sure that we have everything squared away with regard to um, staff and contract language. So there would be plenty to do. Um, in terms of cost, like I said, we'd really have to look at each element of this to determine where we would save money because surely we would save money in some places and look at where we would have to spend more money. Right off the bat, I mentioned we have 80 students in full day kindergarten. We're charging $7,000 a, a student. That's over half a million dollars. We probably, in this current environment, with a 2% tax levy cap, could not just give up a half a million dollars in revenue. However, 
if we charged half as much but enrolled twice as many students, then we would be made whole in terms of a revenue stream that's uh, currently part of the operating budget. Um, the timeline for this, this is something I've been thinking about and talking with certain administrators and board members in terms of our committees and, and just, you know, informally we've been kind of throwing ideas at one another for a while. Um, if we were to move forward with this, and again, perhaps this is a dead end street, but if we were to move forward, it's probably the case that we couldn't accomplish this before the fall of 2024. Um, maybe that's too soon. Maybe if all the stars aligned, um, something sooner would be possible. But I think realistically, we're probably looking at fall of 2024. Um, we would need to, of course, uh, develop a very robust set of planning uh, meetings and schedules. We would visit other schools. We'd solicit parent input. We'd have to work on uh, the student experience with regard to special traditions and orientations. And if we were to move any grade level, it would require an awful lot of logistics on the, in terms of moving, like the actual stuff in a classroom, the teacher resources, the furniture, um, all of that would, of course, be something that we have to lay out carefully. So just to summarize it all, um, there have been a lot of different grade configurations in our schools over the past 200 years since the formation of Chatham Township. Um, our current configuration is probably the one that has held up the longest since 1995. So we're talking 27 years or so. Uh, but given the demands of the time, it might be appropriate to consider whether a change is in order after 27 years living with the schools organized uh, the way they currently are organized. So that is it. Uh, this will be available uh, online, of course, and I'll invite the board members up to ask any questions or offer any thoughts. Thank you, Mike. That was quite a quite a, a mouthful. Um, my one thought was, did you hand out? You should have handed out aspirin prior for the board for that one. But we have been talking about it for a little bit, and it, it's not a magic switch. But I do have a couple of questions, and I know there's going to be a tremendous amount of challenges, and I'm sure the board has a lot of uh, questions and concerns. One thing that jumped out at me: you said we wouldn't need to be concerned about the influx of housing if we do this redistricting, but if there's 259 units coming online down at River Road, you're not knowing, you know, how many kids are going to have 40, 50. I don't know. How, do, how does that not impact, for example, Washington Avenue with the K-2 to two model versus a K-3 to three model? Point well taken. So the, I guess the housing could impact or will impact um, regardless, right? Like even if there are 10 students total, um, you could argue that that has an impact. Right we would be able to better manage whatever impact we have, and it would be much more likely that we wouldn't need to rezone the neighborhoods if we didn't have a full grade level in each school. So, so like to, to, if we took Washington Avenue and we just said, um, for argument's sake, that there are five sections of first grade at Washington Avenue School. Yeah. If we took five sections of third grade out of Washington Avenue School, then we're left with five classrooms. Mm -hmm. If we put in full day kindergarten, we already have a two thirds to three quarters of those students attending Washington Avenue now, either in half day kindergarten or full day kindergarten. So removing the five sections, in order to put full day kindergarten in and make it universal, we only probably would need like two classrooms. Then we'd be left with three. So the, the impact of the, of if there was an enrollment shift due to housing or for any other reason, everyone just finds the Washington Avenue neighborhood the most desirable for, you know, 
we would be able to manage that better with more space in Washington Avenue that we would gain from not having a full grade level there? Simply because enrollment went down, but when enrollment, you know, goes back up, we're going to be in the exact same situation. Do you anticipate busing from River Road or not? I just, you know, it, it actually said, number four, no need to worry about redistricting. I'm worrying about it. So I understand that you mean guarded against it, but I guess, and again, I, we're not going to have answers for it now, but that is one of my concerns, is mm -hmm. that housing, and, and every every district in the in New Jersey is dealing with housing. I mean, there's just a huge, and, and this is round two, and I, I hate to speak for the borough of the town, township, but, you know, there's more rounds of affordable housing coming down the pike that they're going to have to deal with, and I don't envy their position at all. Um, so I just I would just like to vet that out a little bit. So I know you say we you know it would guard against, but I would like to delve into the numbers a little bit more because then you're not going to have three empty classrooms sitting at Washington just waiting for enrollment to come back up. It's going to be evenly spread out, and you're you know so we'll have to just dig in, you know, a, a, as your staff works through some of these numbers. I think it's imperative. We've been talking for 10 years that full day kindergarten is something that we believe would be instructionally beneficial. We just simply didn't have the room or the money this will help us get there. So I think your question, is it worth exploring? I think the short answer is absolutely yes, it's worth exploring. Um, it won't be without its challenges. Um, you know, I'd love to hear what the rank and file staff have to say about it. Um, I'd love to hear what people that have gone through the whole K to, you know, lived here all their lives, you know, and, and seen all those configurations. You know, did one work better? Did it shift for a reason? I'd like to dig into that a little bit. Um, the full day kindergarten, I think, puts us at a disadvantage. I mean, let's not, let's not kid ourselves. We, 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 a lot of us moved to Chatham for the school districts, and a lot of us have, you know, stayed here maybe longer than we should have, but we kind of count our, our house as part of our retirement package. It's part of our financial portfolio. We count on, on being able to sell our house at a, at a premium, and I think full day kindergarten, maybe Ann can step in on that since that's more of her profession. Um, I think we'd be fooling ourselves to think that full day kindergarten if we're, we, if we're one of only, you know, 20 districts, it's going to put us at a disadvantage to neighboring towns. Um, and maybe we'll always be able to sell our house, but not in a week or two weeks. Maybe it'll take six months. Um, but again, it's, it's, it's an absolute consideration that it's instructionally good, but it's also good for the residents to be able to, um, you know, sell their house at a premium in, a, in short order. Um, again, Ann probably has a better insight onto that. So I want to pause and um, let other board members you know, see what they're panicked about, um, see what jumped out on that slides. Nick, could you turn on Bradley's uh, mic? Is the assumption that bringing on a potential fourth elementary school and rezoning the entire town more work than doing this? We could definitely explore that too. I think our initial discussions about that were that it would be even more um, costly and disruptive potentially. One of the reasons why is that Lafayette, because it was built as a middle school, uh, doesn't have bathrooms in the classrooms. Uh, it's not, it, it's, it would take a lot more to convert Lafayette to a, an, a primary lower elementary building than it would to change Lafayette to grades three, four, or move a fifth grade to the middle school. Understood. Michelle. Um, I just want to make sure that when we, I'm, I'm in full support of full day kindergarten. I think it's instructionally the best practice and I think we need to be trending in that direction to prepare our youngest students, especially for the quantum leap to first grade. So, um, however, I don't know how comfortable I am um, asking families who pay taxes in this town to pay for kindergarten if this is what we're offering. So I want us to look at that more carefully um, you know, right now it's optional. If all we're offering is full day kindergarten, then that is what we are offering. And people who live in Chatham pay a considerable amount of taxes to live here. And I don't want to burden any family with an additional hardship. Um, I think it's something we need to look at more carefully. We need to give ourselves time to look at this and look at if we're downsizing in other grades and programs that perhaps this is something that we can be creative about how we can allocate dollars to make sure we can run a robust kindergarten program with the tax dollars that we have. Good point. Um, how about over here? Anybody, any thoughts over here that jump out at you? And you don't, don't feel pressured. I know you need to absorb and 
Um, but if there's a thought, if you want to throw it out there. Nick, could you turn on Mr. Ryan's mic? Dr. Sousa, can you expand a little bit about some of the challenges that we would have if we were to redistrict? I mean, you don't have to do it today, but maybe I mean, what's, what's the issue with redistrict, redistricting? Um, we're going to have the same transportation issues that we have. That, you know, if, we, if transportation is the issue with re, redistricting, we're going to have this moving Lafayette to you know, put, putting third and fourth graders in there, isn't that going to in, have the same issue with transportation? Yes. Or well, the what redi other issues are there? Redistricting doesn't get us full day kindergarten. So redistricting might be necessary if enrollment patterns shift. Um, if we were to go down the road of looking at four K through four schools, right, go back to the way it was 30 years ago, um, then you're, you're just changing the neighborhood zones for every school in the community. And doing that, aside from the transportation, then you have folks who will have bought a house in the neighborhood, assuming that the elementary school was the one listed when they, when they purchased the home. You invariably have some students with siblings where they, they've now been rezoned, you know, the, the younger sibling has been zoned to a different school and you have to account for that either by drawing a line in the sand and saying it doesn't matter if you've got a sibling, if you are you know, two years separated, you have to go to the other school, or you make accommodations and that can get a little bit sticky. Um, redistricting and rezoning is something that school districts do. They usually hire a demographer to assist. It's something we can do if we need to, um, but there's no benefit of full day kindergarten being able to be offered from just redistricting. It's just simply to manage the, you know, the current space you have with the current programs you're offering. All right. Thank you. My comment would be um, what gives me the greatest pause is the addition of the fifth graders to the uh, middle school just in terms of their emotional and social readiness. They're young. I mean, I'm, as a parent of the of uh, younger kids and just seeing the transition into middle school, it's rough and the lack of a playground. And I know all those things can be remedied, but how they would be p organized in the building, I, I'd be curious to hear how that looked when that, uh, the fifth to eighth existed before. It just, it, it's a big difference even in that one year to, to already be in a middle school, um, so. Just a thought. Wasn't there like an eighth grade academy or something when when they when they had it in the past? Did you tell me that, Mike? Or did somebody yeah, do that? Eighth, yeah, there are. Well, because that was my question when we had discussed it before too. Was you know there's a big difference between a fifth grader and an eighth grader just in terms of maturity and lots of things that they're doing. And um, you know I think it would have to be something we would absolutely have to consider to keep those fifth graders and those eighth graders not separate per se, but you know, Didn't we have to a, an extent. We had that conversation, if I'm not mistaken, about that. We were going to think about we configuring the, the middle school, if I'm not mistaken, where, where fifth and sixth graders, graders would be more over here and seventh separate, and eighth graders right? would be more over here. If I remember that conversation, right? right? Which made it sound quite, you know. Yes, yeah. we, we would certainly need to probably visit some of those schools on the list. Dr. Sortino was principal for a number of years of a five through eight school, so she has experienced transitioning fifth graders into a, uh, a larger school setting. Um, and we'd have to take steps and get input from kids and from parents about what is most valuable or what is, you know, makes them most comfortable about being in a, in a larger school. And we'd have to make all kinds of arrangements and adjustments to ensure that they transition just like they do now in sixth grade or just like they do now into fourth grade in a way that hopefully lowers the anxiety and keeps them in a, in a good spot. Sure, uh, go ahead, Mr. Ryan. Um, one, more, one more question. Are we sure that um, if we if we would offer full day kindergarten, are we sure that we want to reduce the tuition tuition rate? Why wouldn't we keep it the same? Well, I think so. Why that, would we get the same amount of revenue 
Right. That well, we you've today. got. Why not? Yes. Why not more revenue? I think that that would be a discussion of the board. Um, we've got one board member who already has yeah. stated she thinks that the tuition rate should go away. I we have another who might want to leave it where it is. I just put up there the the fact that right now we have five hundred sixty thousand dollars that we have built up over time. You know, going from two sections originally now to four. That is something we'd have to account for, and whether we account for it by you know, keeping it in place, increasing it, redu you know, reducing other areas of expense, but we'd have to address that one way or another because we are, that is going into the bottom line now and helping us to pay for the teachers who are in those classrooms, the paraprofessionals, the materials, so on and so forth. Mr. Heath would argue. How can we charge for kindergarten when people when we're a public school district if they don't have any other option? Full day kindergarten is not a mandated program in New Jersey. No, kindergarten is not a mandated program. Yeah, I, I, Coming I to kindergarten, I, if they're not paying. I'm sorry. I, that's what's <laughs> my Mr. Heap would say <laughs> charge 20000 You know. Yes, <laughs> right. No, he will. He will get up and say that. Okay. Um, well, there's a lot to unpack, a ton to unpack. What's interesting is um, Susan said what concerns her most is fifth grade. And when I was sitting there, I was thinking what excites me most is fifth grade, aside from, you know, the separation. But the fifth graders today are doing work that my current 27-year-old did in seventh grade. So I'm excited that they have access to more programming, I'm excited that they can get into the design and technology two years sooner, because I almost feel like in some aspects we're holding them back a little bit. So I am definitely have concerns, but I have great faith in Dr. Sortino. Um, you know, the fifth, sixth, seventh graders have been in school together, you know, already um, for quite a period of time before that. You know, one would argue, you know, don't separate the fifth graders, separate the eighth graders into, like Ann said, an academy or some other way. But again, this is way outside of my wheelhouse. We're going to let the experts kind of unpack that and come back with recommendation. Um, you know, but if, you know, when I had fifth and eighth graders, I'd rather be separated personally from my eighth grader and hang out more with my fifth grader. So, um, you know, um, but again, we have experts in the room and we're going to defer to your expertise and then look forward to recommendations. And I'm sure folks will be talking about this at back to school nights and at the farmer's market. And it'll be interesting to see how it unfolds. Um, I, I think 2024 is a, a good target, albeit it, it may turn out to be aggressive. I don't know that all the lights will be green, but that would be great. Um, you know, if all the lights are green, maybe you take a pause just to, you know, really dot the I's and cross the T's. But again, I, I wait for the experts to present additional recommendations. Um, and I, I think it's super exciting. Um, like I said, our kids are ready for some of this to be shifted, some of this instructional to be, to be shifted. And our middle school is our largest building. It has, it has the largest. It was designed for four grades. It was, you know, built for four grades. And it, we've had additions, most additions to that school over the last several years. So um, I, I look forward to some additional recommendations and hearing from the experts in the room. I'm going to point to Dr. Sortino since you said she's the expert in the, in the space. <laughs> uh, excellent. Um, thank you, Mike. That was a lot. <clears throat> I should have taken aspirin beforehand. Um, is that your conclusion of your report? Or? I, th I think that's it for me. Um, does that help us at all? Um, in any capacity with the, the, I mean, everybody knows there's a national teacher shortage. It's in all the papers. There's a crisis. They're not, we're not graduating as many teachers. Does, is, is, in any way, does that help or, or not really? It potentially can make it. I don't think it would okay. move the needle one way or the other. Um, because again, that's what keeps me up at nights now, which we could talk about a little bit further, but I was hoping that maybe there were some benefits there as well. Okay, fantastic. So thank you. Um, any additional questions before I move on to Peter? You all know where to find Mike if a question comes up anyway. Um, okay, great. Uh, Mr. DeQuilla, over to you. Sure. Um, Dr. LaSusa stole part of my thunder, but I did want to report that in spite of the bus driver shortage, first student has been able to operate and staff every one of the district routes so far into this school year. And they did work diligently with um, the transportation coordinator to accommodate the new start times and, and to reconfigure their scheduling. In addition, um, as of last Thursday, all students that had requested subscription busing have now been assigned to routes as of last Thursday. And believe it or not, some people didn't submit requests for subscription busing until the beginning of September. And okay. we were able to uh, accommodate everybody. So everybody that requested a bus 
that is under the mandated mileage has received a, you know, a route. So we okay. did our best to accommodate everybody with as minimal walking distances to routes as possible, but everybody's mm -hmm. happy and transportation is rolling efficiently so far. So we have a few tweaks to make yet, but it's doing very well. And, and I think you're being very humble, um, Peter. There is a national bus shortage. There is a shortage of bus drivers. And Peter, I know you're being humble there, but he and his team worked tirelessly, um, you know, making things happen, making deals, jumping in where he could, helping out, you know, tirelessly over the summer. We've probably had the smoothest transition in transportation this year, and that is in, in all 100% Peter and his team making that happen. Um, I don't know if you know, Carolyn De Councilman Dempsey gave you a shout out because she had heard positive things about, you know, how smooth the, the transportation went. So, again, you're being very humble, but thank you on behalf of all of us. I thank you, and I have tried to be a good uh, business partner to First Student, where if they needed some kind of favors, I have tried to help. I, you know, I helped them go to the borough planning borough so they could get extended on River Road for a year. Had suggested various, as I drive around, suggest various spots for a depot. We did allow them to use Cougar Field. Um, the township is being very supportive and leasing them space uh, at the old Charlie Browns to park buses until that construction gets underway. So that's, you know, all the help and all the contributor. Just trying to, you know, um, by me and the district giving out to first student, I think they reciprocated and made sure they helped us. Right. So I think we've reaped yeah. the benefits of, you know, whatever we were able to right. do. So it's to me, that's how you do business. Right. You know. It's a lot of work, though. It's not just luck. It's no. you work in it. But so. that's all, you know, part of what I'm supposed to do, I think. Yeah. <laughs> well, you went above and beyond. So thank you. Uh, on the construction update, very quickly, the Lafayette roof, the only remaining item to be done um, is the metal trim work that goes on the edge of the roof and, you know, where the roof and the building meet at the top. Once the metal is fabricated, that will be done second shift. No effect why uh, any students are in the school. And the other more troubling construction, as was mentioned, is on the 11 CHS uh, B-Wing Univents. The Univents were delayed and then delayed. Uh, the current anticipated delivery is the middle to the end of October. Once they're delivered, the contractor will put them in on second shift. He is hopeful after he does one or two that they'll be able to do two a night. Uh, so that'll get done hopefully as soon as possible. If we come past after October 15th and the heat needs to be turned on, the building, the existing unit event will provide heat. So for the fact that, you know, knock wood, we do not have any massive cold thing, the rooms will be remain comfortable for the students and the teachers. And that's all I have, unless there's any questions. Um, I just have a question. I asked um, oh. at the August 22nd meeting if you would be able to reach out to our insurance carrier and investigate what impact the district, if any, has had um, regarding the lawsuit put against the district. Um, and I know it was a, you were super busy opening schools. So. Re regarding the, um, the lawsuit onto the district for the curriculum, for the presentation of the seventh grade curriculum, the district did incur the deductible cost of $7,500, so that was in the early mm -hmm. stages of 2018. The claim that started in January of 2018, so far the insurance company has paid out just shy of $96,000 of expenses on the claim, and the claim still remains open. Okay, thank the you. The insurance company would in no way good faith tell me what effect the, I'll call it near $100,000 had on our rates over the last four years. Just as everybody has experienced, do you submit a car accident claim, your insurance they rates go up. go up. Would they go up every year? Yes. Would they go up a magnitude? Should they have gone up 2% and went up two and a half, three, four percent 3%? No one will ever say what was attributable. So. Okay. Thank you. Okay. And unless there's any other questions, that's all I have. That's great. Thanks. Um, thanks for bringing that up, Peter. So our insurance is going to go up, you know, as a result of just natural business and, and this claim. Um, and I just want to clarify, since the, you bring up the lawsuit, um, folks had asked me I, on the last meeting on the 22nd of August, I had done a fairly lengthy uh, recap and summary of the lawsuit because it was recently remanded back to the district court. Um, it was being appealed and then it was remanded back to the district court. To court. Um, just clarification, some folks came up and said, well, why don't you just drop it? Well, gosh, we would if we could, but we're the ones being sued. So we can't dro just drop it. Um, well, why don't you give them what they want? 
well, we, do, we don't play the video, you know, we're, we have to offer the curriculum, we can't do that. Um, you know, again, the, the Thomas More Law Center is doing it for the publicity in hopes of getting to the Supreme Court and be able to fundraise. Um, you know, what's interesting though is the Thomas More Law Center cannot continue this lawsuit without Libby Hilsenrath's say-so. So while the borough resident continues to sue us at no cost to her, the Thomas More Law Center is going to keep going unless she says stop. Um, so we're going to continue to incur costs. We're going to con possibly continue to incur time lost if we have to redo some of the depositions. Um, certainly our attorneys will continue to get line their pockets with the money, with the residents' money. Um, so, you know, it's interesting that it was even more, the conservative Supreme Court in Bremerton versus Kennedy ruled that Coach Kennedy can pray, but yet our teachers can't do their jobs and teach curriculum that's mandated by the state. So it, it, this will continue to go on. It will continue to be somewhat in the papers. Uh, Peter, if you can continue to monitor the monetary impact, and Mike, if you can monitor, monitor any impact to the teachers. I mean, being a teacher now is just downright hard. It's, it, it, it used to be difficult, it used to be challenging, now it's downright hard. Um, and it's hard to recruit teachers. And two of our middle school teachers were named in this lawsuit by name. So anytime you Google their name, that's what you're gonna see. When our previous assistant superintendent went for her new job, that was the first question they asked. She was sued by name. It's not that Libby Hilsenrath sued the school district of the Chathams. It's not that she sued Dr. Lasusa. She sued two of our middle school teachers by name and still has yet to drop them from the lawsuit. Um, again, I get why Thomas More Law Center is doing it. It's, it's publicity, it's money, it's in hopes of getting to the Supreme Court. I cannot for the life of me figure out why Libby Hills and Rath is continuing to sue us and not dropping the suit. Her son is no longer in the district. He graduated, he's on to his, on to his adulthood. Um, the first sentence of the lawsuit says, you know, Libby Hills and Rath on behalf of her minor son. That was five years ago. Um, and again, what I, what I find interesting is that seventh graders are great, they're fantastic. They're just not gonna be converted after a worksheet. I can't get my seventh grader to make their bed. I don't know, if these teachers had that kind of power persuasion, I would ask them to use their powers for maybe different reasons, but unfortunately, we're gonna have to continue with this lawsuit, we're gonna have to continue to pay, and I don't know, do you put money aside, Peter? Um, I'm gonna look to Bradley, do you put money aside in the finance bucket, you know, is it 5,000, is it 10,000, is it 50,000? Like, how much do you set aside from the, of the residents' money in anticipation of multiple appeals? Even if McNulty says, yep, you guys are right again, summary judgment, it goes up to the Third Circuit, they appeal it again, and it could go on, this, this cycle could go on. Definite amount of money. Okay, so keep that in mind when we're doing budget season. Um, and Michelle, I know you've kind of been spearheading, if you could also keep an eye and uh, keep us honest on some of that front, I'd appreciate it. Uh, Peter, did you have any additional items? Um, I'm finished. You're finished, okay. Any questions for Peter on any, anything that was talked about? Bradley, nope, you're good. Excellent. Uh, fantastic. Committee reports. Um, we're going to start off with Ms. Ciccarelli in personnel. Uh, yes, we met on Wednesday the 14th, and we basically discussed the shortage of substitutes and paraprofessionals and what our amazing recruiting strategies are moving forward. So anything we can do to attract uh, teachers and subs and paras, and please spread the word. If anybody's looking for some something to do with their time. We can use you. And I don't know when we're meeting next. October 19th, we are meeting next. Excellent. Thanks, Anne. And we did spend a considerable amount of time, not just on subs and powers, but the, the, again, the national teacher shortage. Mm -hmm. I mean, probably predates you, Beth, but at one time we were able to, if the social studies position opened up, we'd get 400 applications. Beth, is that the case now? Do you, no. no. No longer, right. It's, mm -hmm. I mean, you keep saying, I know you're, you're being creative and you're doing the best you can, but it's very difficult to recruit. It's, it's even more difficult to retain. I mean, teachers are retiring in, in droves um, because they can. It's difficult. Um, Patterson just offered, I think, $7,500 for a signing bonus. There's districts that get far more state aid than, than we get, so we, it's very challenging. How, how do we compete with that? But we need to somehow figure out a way to, to retain our veteran teachers. They need to be, again, and Pizza Friday only goes so far, wearing jeans on Tuesday. It's not going to do it. We need money. We need money to pay salaries. We need money to somehow make the lower, again, I know the guide is very complicated and I couldn't even begin to imagine um, how that unfolds, but we need to be able to recruit teachers out of college. 
at one time, they're, if they were graduating thousands of teachers, they're now graduating hundreds of teachers. So everybody's vying for those exact same bodies. And, you know, Chatham needs to be competitive. It doesn't help that, you know, two of our teachers were named in a lawsuit. That certainly doesn't make us competitive, but it would certainly help if, I mean, money. It, it, it's all about money. I mean, I know, I, you know, I work on Wall Street. A lot of problems could be solved with money. So we're going to have to figure out how do we get the teachers more salary? How do we, you know, and, and Mike, you and I have talked about this at length. Is it, you know, do we go out for a second question? That'll be, you know, something the finance will have to talk about. You know, targeted just for salaries. Do we, do we increase class sizes? Do we, um, you know, in my son's district out in Los Angeles County, they have one teacher teaching third and fourth grade. So they just merge the classes together. Um, I sat at a wedding last weekend. There was one gentleman who teaches ninth grade English. He has 42 kids in one of his sections. That can't happen. I mean, Chatham has always set the bar, you know, 20, 25, but it may have to go up to 30. I don't know. We're going to have to be creative, but we used to be shielded. We used to have an edge. We've mitigated the teacher crisis for as long as we could, but now it's, it's at crisis mode here in Chatham. You know, Beth is not getting the applicants that she used to get. You know, and, and those that you get, you know, you have to kind of take what you can get and, and that's that. It might not have been your choice five years ago. So again, sir, being a teacher is hard. It's just downright hard. It, it's just a hard job and we need to figure out a better way to retain and recruit our staff. Something has to change. And again, there's no one silver bullet, but I think we're gonna have to do a few things and make that happen, uh, including, you know, going out to the residents and saying, our 2% isn't going to cut it. We, we need to increase it. And I don't have the math. I mean, I have back of the envelope numbers, but, you know, Bradley, I hate to put another brick in your bag, but if you can kind of, you know, kick some of those numbers around, what would it take and, and work with Dr. LaSusa and, you know, what's going what's gonna to move the needle in getting teachers in the door, you know, particularly from a recruitment point of view. Um, again, I know that was a lot, but that is really, a, we're at critical, I don't know, Mike, if, do you disagree if we're, I don't know if I should look at Beth or you, but on, on a teacher shortage, you know, would you say we're at a critical point yet? Pair on fire. We're, we're, at a, we're at a critical point with paraprofessional staff, and paraprofessionals play a critical role in the right. district in supporting all students. We're at a massive disadvantage when it comes to paraprofessionals because of decisions made years and years and years ago. Um, and the teacher educator Crisis. I don't. I don't know if I'd go as far to say we're in, you know, crisis mode here. But um, it's astounding to see just the difference. I think this year we brought on roughly 30 certificated staff members. I believe all but one was coming from another school district because there there aren't they're not graduating from the colleges and universities. Right. So we're we're we've been a little bit successful in cannibalizing teachers from other school districts that can only go on so long and it's also much more expensive to do than recruit sure. folks out of school but the job fairs that beth used to go to don't even they're, they're, they don't happen anymore um and the job fairs that do happen that she has started to go to um are having fewer potential candidates attend them so it's it's ugly i was at a, on a conference call earlier today with superintendents from all over the state that are struggling and kicking all kinds of ideas around about how to try to get around this or make ends meet. Yeah, I just want to stay in front of it. I don't want to say we're behind it yet, but we could get behind it very quickly. You can only st borrow, you know, get recruit teachers from other districts for so long. That pool will dry up. I just want to make sure Chatham stays competitive and we can keep our class sizes where we want them. I don't know what that number is, but, you know, where we want them. Um, so I think we're just going to have to really, you know, come up with a few strategies to combat this issue. Okay, thank you. I'm sorry, Ann, anything else? Uh, no, that's it. Oh, fantastic, thank, thank you. you. Um, Michelle, for curriculum? Yes, um, curriculum met on Wednesday, September 14th, and um, Dr. Donahue kind of gave us an update on a couple of things. First, with the Start Strong Testing Administration, which is currently running through uh, Lafayette Chatham Middle School and Chatham High School this week. Chatham High School um, has, is the only school impacted with delayed openings. Um, in addition, um, we got an update on the health and phys ed standards. Uh, we're gonna continue with the plan that parents um, and guardians will get access to the lesson material as they relate to sexual health lessons. And again, we'll have the ability to opt their child out um, if they do not want their child to, to participate in those particular lessons. Um, 
NJSLA testing um, reports from the spring of 2000, I don't know what year we're in, 22, um, will be going out um, the first, roughly around the first week of um, October, and the Board of Education will have a presentation on November 7th at our meeting with the results um, from that testing. It'll be a unique year because we usually, um, we compare the testing to the prior year. We have not, we will not have testing to compare it to be, due to the pandemic. So um, we'll just see, kind of use maybe this as the benchmark and move forward. Um, and then um, NBC News was in our district last week to um, film a segment that will air this Sunday, September 25th, um, on Sunday today. Um, it had to do with the science standards as they relate to climate change. And the segment will include just how it's connected to other content areas, not just um, environmental science and science. Um, Chatham High School students were interviewed with permission from their parents, um, and this will be something to watch and look forward to if you're interested this coming Sunday, the 25th. So I think that's, oh, um, just, and then we got an update on the ESL program. Um, and we're seeing an uptick in certain areas of ESL students and um, how we're gonna work creatively to help um, address those needs as well. So I'm not sure, did I get everything? I think it was with me while you were there. Okay, thank so is, you. Was there a question? No. no. Any questions for Michelle? That was an awful lot. That was a long meeting. Long meeting, good meeting. Thank you, Dr. Dr. Donahue for championing a lot of that. Um, so Michelle, just, I'm sorry, if I can just clarification on the testing. Yep. So we're just gonna show the, the most recent scores and not do a year over year comparison because of COVID? Or? Well, we can't do it because we don't do have it. them. Right. So the, the last scores I think we have are from 2019. Which okay, which is not, like, right, it's not, not a comparison. Apples apples. So okay. we'll just have to wait on um, this year, we'll get an update and then perhaps next year we can compare. And the Start Strong is here to stay. Is that your understanding? And, and? And, and additional testing in the spring? Yes. And there's no, there's no pushback on any of that. I know the Start Strong is not as invasive. Um, it doesn't take as much of students' time, but a lot of the standardized testing takes up you know, instructional time. Mm -hmm. it does. There's a lot of pushback, but the commissioner has told us that the intention is for Start Strong to stay. With no ease up in the spring testing? Correct. Spring mm -hmm. testing is a federal requirement and Start Strong is something that New Jersey has determined it wants to use to measure how well students have retained prior year standards. Okay, interesting. I think I missed that nuance that one was federal, one was a state mandate. Um, not that it helps us, but it, 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 it gives me a mo little more clarity, so thank you. All right, onward and upward with the testing. I'm sorry, Michelle, was that the conclusion? Yes. Okay, fantastic. Uh, Mr. Smith, Finance and Facilities? Uh, finance and Facilities met just before this meeting uh, at 6.30 tonight. Um, we spent a lot of time going over the personnel shortage and uh, the concept of a second question and how that would work out. Um, and also what we have to do to remain competitive from a financial standpoint right. relative to our other districts. So we're gonna have some, some data uh, on that to share. Oh, great, group. thank you. Um, we also spoke about our capital reserve balance and all the potential uses that we could um, put that money to use. Um, we spoke about a concept of uh, how the district verifies residency. Um, and then we also got a construction update from Peter. Okay, interesting. Did you ask about residency because you, there's a concern or you just wanted to understand the process? We just wanted to understand the process okay. about how we're verifying residency within the district. Okay, and were you satisfied with the response? Okay, <laughs> more to follow. More to follow. Okay, very good, thank you. Has that been brought up as an issue? I, I can speak to that a little bit. Um, so last year, we discovered a couple of students who were not residing in Chatham who were attending the schools. Um, Peter, uh, corresponded with those families and ended up recuperating tuition uh, or recouping tuition for, for them. Uh, but there are other districts that uh, constantly deal with residency related issues. And so as a result of that, there are um, vendors out there who provide services to district to verify residency. Uh, from time to time, we've hired private investigators to determine where students are residing. Um, but we had two you know, solicitations or emails that we had seen 
um, from different vendors or third parties who would come in and do a residency type of audit. Uh, so we just brought that to the Finance Committee to discuss to see if it's something that perhaps we should do, um, if not on a periodic. Turn on Michelle's mic. I'm sorry. Michelle, could you repeat that? Yeah. I asked in the spring as well kind of where we, what the policy procedure was because um, I don't know about any of you, but I enrolled my kids in kindergarten. They went all the way through, and I only showed my residency requirement once. So I just think it's something that maybe when they change school, when there's a change of school environment, you know, maybe to Lafayette or to different places, it's kind of a good checkpoint. Um, I don't think there are many people taking advantage of it, but I think there are people taking advantage of it, and I don't think it's fair to the taxpayers. And just to clarify that, you know, requirement in New Jersey to attend school is to live in the school district. So owning property is not, does not meet that standard. Um, a child must reside here in order to attend schools here. So every now and again, we come across an instance where a child is not residing here, but is attending the schools. What do you do where they're, um, you know, shared custody and one lives in Chatham and one lives in Madison? The law is that it's where the child spends the majority of the time, the majority of nights. Not, so 50% or more of where their head hits the pillow? Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, granted, that's yeah, not something we're ever going to no, verify. Gonna if there's a, a child who's split between no, two No, I, I was just curious what the law was. Yeah. We're going to have a lot of 400 units coming into town. There's going to be a, a, a broad bunch of people coming into the county. You're right. not sure if they're actually sure. residents or not. Yeah, I can so understand. 400 more units are going to be have to look, have, have yeah. to be look at. And that's the ones we know of, right? There's more coming down the pike in, a, in future rounds. Correct. Um, so, I, yeah, that makes sense to check the process. I was just curious if there's something that's spurred on or... Um, no, not to my knowledge. Okay. Just the two emails that Dr. Okay. Masusa and uh, Peter uh, received. Oh. I got it. Perfect. Thanks. Thanks for the clarification. Um, anything else, Bradley? Nothing else on finance. Oh, good. Um, Mr. Ryan, policy and planning? Policy and planning has not met since, since the end of last year. Um, I'm not certain when the next policy meeting is, but... Uh, it's in October, early so, October, but I forget the date. Okay, okay. October 12th. And we expect that, um, I, maybe I should ask Mike, uh, Dr. Lasusa, do you have any updates on the policy audit that we were going to I look into? I went back and forth with them uh, about a week or so ago, and they were working on it and said they were still moving along. They would reach out if they needed anything, and then they would give us an update whenever they're a little further in the process. Okay. Thank you. Is the expectation that's done this year, next year, five years? As soon as we can do it. I'm sorry, I couldn't. As soon as we can do as it. As soon as we can do it. I think initially when we reached out, and I don't remember the month that we made the determination, maybe it was around May, um, but I can't remember exactly. They told us it would take about six months okay. for the transition to happen. And will they unwind any policies, and maybe I should look at, well, I'm looking at both mics, but I'm going to look at this mic, um, that they may no longer apply because COVID. I know you worked your tail off well during COVID and, and, and making policies you know, appropriate for the moment, and things are changing literally day to day. Do you think there's anything that they have to unwind or undo, or you won't know until you we get can, back? We can do that ourselves. Okay. I mean, it, it, the, the main focus is moving away from Strauss SMA to another vendor. Um, and during that process, we'll examine all the policies we have in place and see if they're still applicable. Okay. Uh, and those would probably include the COVID ones, but we can, we can do those independent of that if we need to. Okay. Put them in the future pandemic folder. <laughs> that hopefully will not be our problem. That, that's part of what they're doing too, Jill, is they're looking at every policy, all the references and citations, because a lot yeah. of them have changed over the years. We, we just had a, yeah. a, an adjustment to the HIV policy that we're working our way through just in the past um, six months or so. So they're, they analyze every policy that we have in relation to current statute, current regulation, and they're you know, um, guidance as the New Jersey School Boards Association. Okay, great. Okay, fantastic. I'm sure there's some that are outdated that are just, or, or no longer serve that purpose anymore. Um, okay, fantastic. Um, thank you. Thanks, Mike, and let us know how that goes, the status of that as it unfolds. Oh, well. Um, does anybody have any liaison reports? Susan? Hold on, wait for your mic to be on. Thanks. 
um, at the September CF board meeting, the trustees approved a grant in the amount of $16,200 to establish um, more collaborative and engaging world languages spaces for the students at the middle school in grades six to eight. Um, this is gonna enable them to interact not just with the language, but the culture and the content in new ways. The uh, funds will be used primarily to purchase desks with dry erase surfaces and also to create um, literacy centers in three classrooms. So that's the latest from them. Thanks. Excellent, perfect. Anybody else um, have anything they wanna shout out? Oh, Chris, I'm sorry. Uh, Record Advisory Board met and they had very spirited conversation about uh, field allocations and how to enhance their current system because basically it all goes through Carol and she talks to school districts and so anyway they want to try to put together a uh, an allocation program like a, like a software program so they've decided they're going to move ahead and try to figure out a program they could use or find a program they could use uh, they discussed lighting parameters at Shem Pike at nighttime where lights are supposedly uh, have to be off by 10 30 at night uh, that's an ordinance, but we shut them off at 9.30 anyway, so then it's going to be six nights a week was what they're planning on doing. They currently don't do it on Friday nights, but think they're going to start using the fields from Monday through Saturday night. And they okay. can shut them down by 9.30. That's at Shun Pike. They had a conversation at Shun Pike about Shun Pike's turf, about perhaps needing to re-turf the field. It's been there 10 years now, so that's... <laughs> Welcome aboard. <laughs> exactly. So, because they have some, you know, problems with those fields, or one, you know, that's just what it is. So they're they're, they're starting to talk about that. Uh, they thank the uh, uh, borough for taking care of their basketball courts because they did a really nice job with the basketball courts yeah, at Garden great. Avenue. So they look fabulous. They're right by my house. It's great. Um, Let's see what else we have. There was a lot. It was a very busy meeting. That's very spirited really was, from your description. Yeah, it was quite spirited. And the other one what was the other discussion. Uh, baseball field. Oh, the other one was Lum Field. They're thinking about lighting Lum Field. They want to bring up a discussion about lighting Lum Field because they current light them, currently light them with the uh, generators. Yeah, which are loud and smelly, and that's why I don't go to Kruger Night. They're loud, they're smelly, it's just I can't stand them. So maybe they're thinking about lighting them, you know, lump, which was a non-starter when they first turfed lump, but that's another conversation they might have, just because they already light it, they're thinking about doing it with permanent lights. Another cost, so that's just a thought. Um, let's see, uh, baseball, uh, the baseball pro, uh, club, they're having their tryouts, uh, the travel tryouts in October, and uh, they're gonna have rec signups in December, so look out for those if it gets to play baseball. Uh, Hoops Travel will be having their tryouts. This is for boys and girls, I'm assuming. I just, right. they're gonna be having them, their Hoops Tryouts for travel in September. Regular signups are starting sometime in September as well. Uh, wrestling program, which you kids were all a part of, which is a great program. They run it through a, so Brett Motto was there talking how they, they run it through, it's called Hill Valley Wrestling Club and it's Chatham, Summit, and New Providence. So they'll wrestle out of New Providence, but the Hill, this Hill Valley Wrestling Club, you could sign up through them, it's, and it's through uh, the New Providence website, the New Providence uh, rec okay. website. So if your kids aren't ball sport kids, they should give wrestling a try, it's a really good program. You know, you guys, your kids went through it. And then uh, that's pretty much it. And they had a, uh, uh, what was the last thing? Um, men's basketball sign up. So if you're in men's league, if you play basketball, I'm a little too old for that now, but uh, you can go play. Uh, they have men's sign ups. They'll be coming up in the near future, so. Okay, great. That's that. Thank you. And like things like lighting Lum Field have nothing to do with the school district. They, that's the record. This is just, I'm just advising you with, the, okay. with their whole, no, it has nothing to do with okay. that. Although I was posed a question at the very end about the referendum that we were talking about with the, which, fields, with the fields in the back here. Oh, right, right, Which right, I told right. them was dead in the water at the last Zoom meeting we were at it, but the finance because the cost of the fields went sure. double, if I, as I remember it. But it was a call to someone, someone asked me if we were ever revisiting that, and I said, not yeah, it didn't get a lot of love. I mean, we could always, again, my hair's on fire over teachers' salaries and things like right. that. My hair's not on fire going on. On, on that stuff. But um, again, the will of the people on that one, because they'd have to pay for it. Um, so if they think lighting a particular field is more important, then, you know, who am I to judge? 
Um, but I want you to start every sentence at the rec meeting is the school district has no money. Okay? So when they say, hi, Chris, how you doing? What's your answer? The school district has no money. Well, I forgot they were talking about redoing Estonia Field as well. But, you know, they're redo they want to redo Estonia. I forgot that part. They want to redo Estonia Field. Upper or lower? Lower. Upper is like a, cow, a cow, cattle ranch, supposedly, it sounds like. So that's, that's sort of like it's no love at all. And, and your so. response was, the school district has no money? Pardon me? And your response was, the school district has no money. Oh, no, I wasn't talking. No, I, you know, I, we weren't no, taking money in. We're just doing our, you know, we're you just, know. you know. I, you know, I joke, but traditionally, you know, the township manages the township fields, the borough manages the borough fields, and the school district pays for and manages the yeah. school district fields. And, you know, we don't ask them for money. And it's open, you know, all these fields are open for all of the residents. They're owned by the residents, but that's generally how the accounting was done. Um, so I, while I jest, the school district has no money. That. Okay, good. You've made that clear tonight. Great. Thank you for the spirited <laughs> update. I appreciate it. Um, so you'll have to tell us later what the spirited part was about, so that'll be fun. <laughs> um, I appreciate that. Any additional liaison reports? Any thoughts? Nope. I'm good here? Great. Okay. So that was, uh, it took us a little bit to get here, but here we are at the first opportunity for public commentary. Oh, I'm sorry. I skipped over that. Um, so we have to approve our minutes from the August 22nd meeting. There was only a public section, and there was a public session, so I'm sorry. And Mr. Ryan, you were the only one absent. Um, so Peter, if you don't mind, I'll just move this along. All those in favor of approving the August 22nd public session meeting, please raise your hand. Aye. Aye. All those opposed? Abstentions? Duly noted the minutes moved by Ms. Weber and uh, seconded by Ms. Clark. Perfect. Are uh, past zero, 801. Great. Thank you. I appreciate that. And now we're moving on to our first opportunity for public commentary. Um, hearing of the citizens during the public commentary sections of the agenda is an opportunity for any member of the public to be heard about issues which are or are not scheduled for the current meeting. And to help facilitate that orderly meeting and to permit all to be heard, speakers are asked to limit their time um, to a reasonable length of time. Please try and keep it to in the three, three-ish uh, minute range just so we can hear everybody. Um, and there's another opportunity at the second portion of the meeting um, if something strikes your fancy as we move through the agenda. So again, this is um, the public commentary. It's your opportunity to speak to the board. Um, it's not going to be a back and forth. I'll try and keep notes. So if there's something I can address or a different committee chair can address, they will do it um, at the end after we've closed public commentary. So the floor is yours. Again, if you would just introduce yourself and then um, let us know your thoughts. Libby Hills and Rath Chatham Borough. Um, I think this question has been asked before, but the presentation that was given tonight by Dr. Lasuza was that um, included? I didn't see it in the agenda. Was it included in the um, the addendum or the attachments to tonight's agenda? Uh, I, I believe somebody else asked this before. Can can the public see these beforehand so we can come with some educated questions um, and? follow up to that would be has the board of education seen that presentation prior to tonight or discussed any of those items because if they have you know I, again i think it's just in fairness to the public we should be able to you know come with some educated questions about it uh, and the second question i have and you may not know the answer to this right away but i believe um having come to the board of education meetings for a long time we hired a new demographer at some point over the last 10 years? And can you tell me when that was? Because I believe, if I recall right, enrollment was going up, 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 and then we hired a new demographer, and then all of a sudden enrollment started going down. So I'd like to know what year we got that new demographer. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. My name is Laura Noonan, and this is Betsy Long, and we are co-presidents of the Chatham Education Association. We are here tonight to say welcome back to the 2022-2023 school year. Things are finally starting to settle down, with getting used to the new start times and the routines of a normal school year. We look forward to representing the CEA in working together towards a successful negotiations with the board in this time when good educators, paraprofessionals, substitutes are hard to find. Inflation is bearing down on our members' paychecks and the political atmosphere is at a fever pitch. 
We represent staff in this district who showed up during the pandemic to keep the students in school and learning at high levels, and we continue to be here catching students up from losses, personal and academic, they may have on the other side of this pandemic. The staff coming to school kept the buildings open and the students learning throughout the last few years, and we continue to always put our students first. We also look forward to working with the board as you look into the possibilities of some major district changes, especially with the elementary and middle schools. We know that the impact to our staff is an already exhausting climate. In an already exhausting climate is an important factor in those plans to explore these changes. And we must make a point to think about every paraprofessional, custodial staff member, teacher, and support staff affected by these possible outcomes. Lastly, we look forward to thinking outside of the box with you on ways to make the school district of the Chathams even better than it already is, including the recruitment and retention of amazing staff. We are very grateful to continue to have a seat at the table for important discussions. Thank you. Good evening, my name is Bill Karpowick. I live in the borough and having previously lived in the township, have been a Chatham resident for 28 years now. I'm retired and I am currently a substitute teacher at Chatham High School, which quite honestly is my way of giving back to a school district that was so very good to my family over the years. I find the students at the high school to be smart, inquisitive, diverse, and very respectful. My children, both now having graduated from college, enjoy their time at the Chatham school system and like their friends and peers, are fine young adults and productive citizens. I realize that board members and administrators have learned to grow thick skin over the years, and it's your very responsibility to listen to and respond to criticism. Well, I'm here tonight to provide nothing but positive feedback, and I think that it's very important that you hear it because I think too frequently you hear a lot of neg negativity. I was recently at a large gathering of 50-year-old Chathamites, and when the conversation turned to the education experience that our children had had, former students and some current students, everyone was complimentary. Sure. Some people had questioned some school district policies over the years, but they all noted that the board and or the administration, whether they provided the answers that they wanted to hear or not, had listened to and respectfully resp responded to their request. I fully realize that no school district is perfect, but I have the utmost confidence that this board and the district's administrators will continue to make all necessary improvements to ensure that Chatham remains one of the best places to live in New Jersey. I sincerely thank every single school board member, administrator, teacher, and district worker for their hard work and dedication to our children. While I'm up here, I would also be remiss having been actively involved in Chatham Youth Sports for 20 years, if I didn't thank the school district for their very generous allocations of fields and facilities now and over the years. Your partnership with Chatham Recreation over the years uh, has not gone unnoticed. So I thank you all. Bob Patton, Chatham Borough. Uh, first, I'd like to thank Dr. Souza for the kind words. It was an honor and a privilege to speak to the students, and I'm very happy that they benefited from that. Uh, today is the beginning of Start with Hello Week with Sandy Hook Promise. Uh, Dr. Souza brought the program uh, a year or two ago to, to Chatham. Uh, I'd like to recommend that you extend the program for K through 12. Uh, it's had a great beginning. Um, 
the, I, most of you know I was an educator until last January. I retired and I was involved in the Sandy Hook program in my district. It's a great program. Um, the elementary school kids would benefit greatly from it. Um, I hate to bring these statistics up, but these are some of the statistics that we're experiencing in, in the, at the uh, elementary levels. Um, at least 20% of children ages 9 through 17 currently have a diagnosable disorder causing some degree of, an, of impairment. One in 10 has a disorder causing significant impairment. A third of the children ages 9 through 17 with significant diagnosable disorders receive treatment, one third of them. Half of all serious disorders start by age 14, but do not receive treatment, get this, for another six to 23 years. And 40%, this is the really scary part, 40% of visits to hospitals for youth suicide are ages five to 12, almost half. The Sandy Hook Pro, uh, Promise Program is, it would take me hours to describe everything that the, the program does, and Dr. LaSouza can fill you in on the details. Uh, but it's, it's a very good program for extending emotional support for uh, young children, for especially uh, very young children. And uh, it helps identify children in crisis. Uh, a Harvard study has shown that uh, toxic stress, which is basically Severe stress that's unrelenting, that there's, there's not uh, a support mechanism in place, actually affects the architecture of the brain in young children and can lead to not only um, psychological disorders, but actual physical disorders going into adulthood. But the good part is it is not irreversible. If programs like this are, are instituted and the kids receive the support they need along with parental support, their, their prognosis is, is much better. Um, so I, I don't want to take up too much of your time here, but Stephen, uh, Frederick Douglass had a very good quote that kind of sums everything up. He said, it's easier to build strong children than to, treat, than to repair broken adults. Um, so again, uh, I would encourage you to expand the Sandy. It doesn't cost anything. Sandy Hook Promise uh, charges nothing. Uh, and there, uh, the, the district I came from, uh, if you need resources, my assistant superintendent, this guy was phenomenal. Um, I, I've been involved in the program. He did the heavy lifting for, for Sandy Hook Promise, and the program was selected as the best program in the country, over 6,000 other schools. So if you need resources, I've spoken to him. He's a friend of mine. He's at your disposal. So I would encourage you to expand the program. It's a good program and very beneficial, especially to young children. Thank you. Thank you, Captain Penn. Thank you. Um, my name is Jocelyn Matheson. I am a Chatham Borough resident. I do serve on the Borough Council, but I am here solely in my capacity as a resident, as a parent, and someone who cares about this community. Uh, you folks have been hearing a lot from parents who say they want to make sure that they have a say in their kids' education. And I see nothing wrong with that. I don't disagree with that. But I do worry what the end game is there. Today in Florida, a teacher can be sued by parents if she tells a curious second grader that she has a wife. Not the parents of that second grader, but any, any parents can sue that teacher in Florida now. In Missouri, there was a teacher forced to resign for putting up a pride flag in his classroom. And just this week, they announced in Virginia that students will no longer be allowed to use bathrooms marked for the gender that they identify with. This isn't allowing parents to have a say in their children's education. And in my mind, as a family member of, of both gay and transgender people, it is borderline abuse uh, on, on other people's children because you don't want your own, own children to know that gay or transgender people exist. Gay or transgender people and transgender people do exist, and erasing that fact is not education. I'd like you to think about curriculum from the perspective of a kindergartner who has two dads, being taught that families are always one mom and one dad, or from the perspective of those two dads worried about how their kid is being received in school. Um, if you 
I've seen a lot of jokes and memes post posted by a certain group of Chatham residents about kids being allowed to quote unquote choose their gender. They think it's a joke. As someone with a dear family member who is transgender, these jokes are a punch in the gut. Please don't sacrifice their mental health because you're worried about your kids knowing that these relatives exist. I was reading today a book by a famous Welsh historian and author, her name is Jan Morris, and she died recently at the age of 94. I recommend you look her up, Jan Morris, an absolutely beautiful, beautiful writer. She wrote a piece about uh, going on an Everest expedition that was published the day Queen Elizabeth was coronated, and she was born James Morris. One of her many amazing books is a brief piece about being born in a male body knowing that she was female. This has always existed. I grew up in the 1980s and I remember a classmate being bullied horribly because his mom had divorced his dad to live with another woman. I remember whispers behind his back and him breaking down in racking sobs on the school bus. When my sister met the love of her life, a woman 30 years ago, she had to lie for years in order to not jeopardize her job security and security clearance. It is hard to be a teacher today. Imagine what it's like being a gay teacher or a transgender teacher today. There's a reason why we talk about pride in the LGBTQ community. It is because what used to be prevalent in the LGBTQ community in kids and adults was the opposite. It was shame. Shame, what a terrible word. Contrary to rumor, no one is being taught sex in the first grade. They are not. I do hope that kids have opportunities to learn that families come in all shapes and sizes, and that doesn't make them any less of a family. I hope that they are never taught that someone who feels love and attraction for their own gender are bad people or that a boy who wants to learn ballet should man up. Schools are supposed to teach reality, and the reality is that gay people and transgender people exist. They and their loved ones should not be erased from existence. And acknowledging that existence is not the same as teaching about sex, and it is not a far left liberal agenda. I want to close by saying thank you to Dr. Lasuza and this entire Board of Education for your hard work. I am sorry that the work of, of teachers and educators and school board members has been so politicized. A universal value respect is the one we all need to return to, and you all have done an admirable job. Thank you. Thank you, Councilwoman. Good evening, Bill Heap, uh, Chatham Borough. Uh, very good presentation tonight. Uh, I don't have any dog in this fight, and there's lots of moving parts here. Uh, if anybody thought that changing start times was a challenge, boy, this is uh, really going to take some planning. Uh, and I will have to defer to you on this because uh, as I said, my kids are out, and uh, I'm glad I uh, won't have to uh, live through that. Uh, Mrs. Weber, my answer to your question is the school district has no money. Uh, so my, on the topic of my favorite subject, which is full-day kindergarten, uh, I don't see how you can begin to even think about offering a discount just based on quantity. Um, and I don't, I think that charging $20,000 would be a, a bit of an exaggeration, but based on the fact that uh, a fully loaded cost of a student is tw close to $20,000, $10,000 wouldn't be uh, out of the question. Uh, and this is low hanging fruit. This is money that you simply can't afford to give up. We live in a community that is willing and able to pay. I'm not against full day kindergarten, don't have any problem with it. I just don't want to pay for it. And uh, I don't think you should be leaving money on the table. And I know these are discussions that are further down the road, but it's just, uh, I think, too tempting for you to pass up. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Heat. <clears throat> um, any additional public comments? Nobody at the queue, so I'm going to close the current public comments um, and just go back and answer whatever questions did come did arise. Um, the first question was from Mrs. Hilsenrath. Um, oh. oh, she left? She doesn't want the answer? Well, I'm going to answer it anyway. Um, so the question was, maybe she'll watch it on 
on, on uh, rerun. Uh, so one of the questions was, did the board see the presentation before Dr. Lasusa gave it? The short answer is no, but the longer explanation is, um, just for edification or clarification, um, public meetings of the school board are simply school board meetings that occur in a public setting. They're not public meetings that the public drives. Um, similar to council meetings and borough meetings, um, they're, they're meetings of the school board that have to happen in a public setting so that there's no, no you know, um, you know, backdoor deals, no kitchen cabinet, you know, conversations. It's so that everything that we're talking about happens in public other than things that are confidential or legal in nature or potentially damaging to a personnel or a student. So in this instance, we did not see this presentation um, prior, which is why I said, you know, I had a headache after Mike presented it because it, there's a tremendous amount to unpack and it's going to take the better part of two years. Um, so the question was, although the person that asked it left the room, uh, Mrs. Elzenrath left, the, the clarification is that these are school board meetings that occur in public. This is where we conduct our business. I I've, I've have probably not have sat on finance for eight years, so the first time I hear Mr. Smith give a report and the, I see the budget, the first time I'm seeing it is right here, um, so along with you. So this is where we conduct our business. Um, the committees go back and do, you know, kind of machinations and they kick around ideas. Some come to the board meetings, some are just, you know, at dead ends and I never hear about them. Um, so the answer is, it is the first time, but you know, that could have been discussed in committee and now just brought to the full board for, for presentation. Um, Mrs. Silsenrath's second question was on the demographer. Um, when did we last have the demographer report and when is the next demographer report? So going back decades, we had demographer reports for several decades. The last demographer report was coincidentally 2018, which is the same year she started her lawsuit against the school district of the Chatham. Um, we had Dr. Grip do a very comprehensive um, demographer's report, but they're only good for five years, based on birth rates, based on moving, based on housing. So the last one was right in line with the lawsuit, 2018, if folks want to write that down. Um, and we are expecting a new demographer's report, and I believe, uh, Peter, I might be making this up, the end of October, uh, beginning of November. Um, so Dr. Grip is going to give us another five years of data, which is gonna be great. Because the last time he did it, we didn't know what the housing was going to be. Um, a lot of the, the, the borough councils and the township committee members had no idea what the fair share, um, how that was gonna shake out. Um, five years down the road, we know a lot more. Um, so it, it's gonna be great to have that data in hand when Dr. Lasusa and his team start recon talking about reconfiguration and uh, more to follow. So those were the two questions. Uh, thank you to Laura and Betsy for coming out. I know you've had a 12-hour day, um, maybe a 14-hour day, so thank you for coming out. I appreciate it. Um, I don't think there's not one single board member that doesn't know how hard you work. Um, again, it was hard but pre-pandemic. It was harder in the pandemic. And again, you have to deal with, you know, nationally organized, you know, um, as, as Councilwoman Jocelyn said, uh, Matheson said, you know, these are things that are happening at the national level that they want to push into our local level. And again, we just, as Mr. Koparik said, we're just going to trust our educators to kind of keep out the noise and just keep moving forward and do what Chatham does best. But thank you for coming out. Thank you on your behalf of the board to all of the staff. Um, you know, and again, we're going to try and get creative. I know recruitment and retention is top of mind. So, you know, you're not alone in that fight. We're just going to do the best we can in that space. Uh, Mr. Koparik, thank you for coming out. Uh, more importantly, thank you for substituting in the district. If you can recruit some of your friends as they retire and catch up to you, feel free to like say, hey, this is really great. Please feel free to substitute. Um, if any of them want to be powers, that would be even better. Um, thank you for the feedback. It's nice to hear. Um, like you said, typically people only come out to tell us, you know, that we should be delivering pizza for a living and what a horrible job we're doing. So every once in a while, it is nice to hear that um, you know, we're, we're on the right path and haven't quite lost our minds yet. And the board is certainly fortunate because of the staff and the administration. Um, we have fantastic educators and, you know, we're here to guide from a policy, we're here to guide from a financial standpoint, and then the rest, you know, God bless them, they take and, and run with it and have made the school district successful for the last 135 years, so we're gonna continue that. Um, Captain Penn, I don't even know what to tell you. Thank you so much um, for all you do for the school district. Um, we're, Dr. LaSouza is very familiar with Sandra Hook Promise. Several of the board members have attended um, presentations on them, including Dylan's Wings. And, you know, it, we're believers. Um, and, we, you know, we look to our administration to see where it's appropriate to incorporate. And you've been so generous with your district and your time. And we just want to thank you again for that, um, for being that kind of resource to us and somebody we can go to all the time if we have questions on that. 
Um, <clears throat> Councilwoman Matheson, thank you for coming and thank you for your kind words and, and being another voice in the room. Um, I think the board will continue to fight the good fight. Really what's going on nationally with the culture wars and, and telling teachers what they should teach, when they should teach it, how they should teach it, you know, and oh, I didn't like that how you taught that and I'm going to sue you and do it differently. So we're going to continue to fight the good fight here, at least certainly this board and I'm, I'm sure future boards will, will pick up the mantle. And we are very sensitive to the, to the students that have you know, diverse backgrounds and what they might encounter in their day-to-day -day life. And again, the goal here is just to help students, you know, make healthy decisions. Some of the health curriculum is, is strictly safety. And some of it is just to give them awareness and perspectives that they might have not been familiar with and just alternate perspectives so that they can contribute, you know, to a more inclusive society. This is, you know, not rocket scientists. We're just trying to, in partnership with the parents, have good kids, critical thinking kids, um, I think Mike had said at one point 50 or 60 percent of the kids in kindergarten will work in jobs 25 years from now that don't exist today. So then how, how do you teach kids? You teach them, you know, this is a part of it. This piece of curriculum is just one small piece of that. So, um, you know, we will support the teachers. They're mandated to teach a certain set of standards that are mandated by the state. And it's the curriculum that they write that is their secret sauce that makes Chatham an excellent excellent school district. So again, I have to thank the teachers and thank you, Councilwoman, for, for uh, I guess you said you're not here as a Councilwoman, but you're certainly here as a resident and a, and a parent and a, and a concerned citizen. So thank you. Uh, Mr. Heap, you and I always cheese about, you know, we don't have any money, we don't have any money. And I appreciate your, um, your perspective because you're not on an island. I, sometimes I tease that you are on an island, but you're absolutely not on an island in your thoughts and your perspectives. And when I say we don't have any money, unfortunately, the state has a 2% cap. Bill Heap would say, thank God they have this 2% cap and it should be lowered. The 2% cap allows us to, um, you know, pay the teacher showers, pay health benefits, you know, keep the lights on and keep the pro programming going. Um, beyond that, it's a lot of creative accounting that happens between the Finance Committee and Dr. LaSeuss and some of the administrators. Um, the full day kindergarten tuition thing, we're going to have to just, you know, see how that unfolds. We have, you've already heard varying opinions on that. Um, Somehow we have to pay for it. We have to pay for staff. We have to pay for the support staff. We have to pay for the infrastructure. Um, and then we're, we'll, we'll, you know, we will have these conversations in public because the school board meetings occur in public. So more to follow on that. But again, I, I tease you often, but I do appreciate your perspective. And I do want to acknowledge that yours is not one alone on an island. You do speak for you know, some other folks in town. So uh, thank you. I appreciate that. Um, that was it for the speakers. Does anybody else have any additional comments, Mike? Did I go off the rails on something and lie or just make something up along the way there? Not off the rails at all. Uh, there was a question about why I don't share a presentation ahead of time. I give a lot, a lot of presentations, sometimes to staff groups, parent groups right here. Part of the presentation is the narrative and the explanation that accompanies the presentation. So I have no intention of sharing presentations ahead of time. Um, and I just want to thank Laura and <coughs> Ms. Noonan and Ms. Long for sticking it through tonight. Uh, they're always great partners. The reason why I wanted to do this presentation tonight in September is so that uh, we have a long runway the rest of this year to have conversations freely at faculty level and, and uh, department level meetings and in those contexts so that uh, everyone can put their heads together and think about um, you know, what I discussed earlier. So thanks to them. Excellent. Thank you. I'm glad you didn't share the presentation. You would have ruined my weekend <laughs> had you shared that. <clears throat> so I appreciate you not sharing it in this particular instance. Um, any other <clears throat> additions to the public commentary or questions? Nope. Okay, great. So we're going to move on to the regular agenda. We do have another opportunity excuse me, for public comments at the end. <clears throat> but we're going to... joking, not crying. I know. <laughs> a little bit of both, maybe. Um, but excuse me. So we're going to move over to personnel. Um, so, Anne, if you don't mind taking it away. Yeah. Um, I'd like to move action items A1 to 25 on the regular agenda, and then A1, 4, 7, 20. Any questions for Ann or Beth on any of these items? And just a reminder, the agendas are posted in advance, uh, typically by Friday afternoon. They're on the website for all to see. No additional questions? Uh, Peter, do you mind? 
Sure. Agenda items A1 to 25, the addenda, the addendum items of 1, 4, 7, 20, 23, and 26. Ms. Ciccarelli. Uh, yes, except I am um, abstaining from 23 on the addendum. Thank you. Ms. Clark? Yes. Mr. Del Sandro? Yes. Ms. Kenny? Yes. Ms. Ross? Yes. Mr. Ryan? Yes. Mr. Smith? Yes. Dr. Zhang? Yes. And Ms. Weber? Yes. Agenda items, with the exception of A23, pass 9-0. A23 passes 8-0-1. Perfect. Thank you, Peter. Uh, Mr. Smith, over to you for finance and facilities. Yes, I would like to move agenda items B1 to B14 on the main agenda and B15 on the addendum. And also wanted to re-highlight the very generous donation from uh, CEF that Susan Ross mentioned before. Excellent, thank you. Second. Any additional questions on finance or facilities? Uh, Peter, would you mind? Sure, agenda items B1 through 14 and addendum item number 15. Ms. Ciccarelli? Yes. Ms. Clark? Yes. Mr. Del Sandro? Yep. Ms. Kenny? Yes. Ms. Ross? Yes. Mr. Ryan? Yes. Mr. Smith? Yes. Dr. Zhang? Yes. And Ms. Weber? Yes. Agenda items pass 9-0. Excellent, very good. A curriculum, Ms. Clark? Um, yes, I'd like to move curriculum items C1 through C4 on the regular agenda. Second. Dr. Lususa, can you just reinforce that C4 is just, we're required to have a plan. We have no intention at this time of implementing <laughs> virtual instruction, just in case That's someone correct. walked out with an agenda. And yes, we did the same thing a year ago and it never came to life. Michelle, your comment was that we have no intention of offering virtual classes? Correct. In, unless we have a continued teacher shortage, in which case we'll be well, going to school with kids in Kansas. Could be, but just not this school year. Um, excellent. Fantastic. Peter, would you mind? Sure. Agenda item C1 to C4. Ms. Ciccarelli? Yes. Ms. Clark? Yes. Mr. Del Sandro? Yes. Ms. Kenny? Yes. Ms. Ross? Yes. Mr. Ryan? Yes. Mr. Smith? Yes. Dr. Zhang? Yes. And Ms. Weber? Yes. Agenda items pass 9-0. Excellent. Over to policy. Uh, Mr. Ryan, there's nothing on the agenda, but do you have any audibles? No. No audibles at this time. Excellent. Um, so now on to board business. Um, does anybody have anything they want to bring up at this time? Because of course I do. No. <clears throat> I would just ask the committee chairs, in light of the presentation that we just saw in all of your committee meetings, if you can think how they impact your, your sandbox and what are maybe some of the gotchas and um, you know, so if you can keep switching your hat as you sit in committee meetings to see how it might impact, because um, nobody's more, you know, knowledgeable in that particular area than the, the chairs and the committee members that sit on it. Um, I will not be able to come up with everything that finance, you know, will think of, um, having not been in that space for such a long time. Um, so if you can think about the impact to the housing, the impact to the reconfiguration, um, impact it might have to staff and students, and we've already had a few comments and, and excellent concerns on you know, various grid levels being merged, um, physical space, logistics, busing. So as you go to your committee meetings, if you can again unpack the reconfiguration essential question and, and bring up any concerns or questions and, and delve a little deeper with the administration in your particular areas. I don't have any additional comments or business. Anything come to mind? Okay, very good. So we do have our second opportunity for public commentary. Um, if you wouldn't mind queuing up. I know everybody left, that's why. <laughs> um, okay, so there's nobody, uh, nobody, nobody rushing to queuing up. So we do have an executive session. Um, action may be taken. Um, it won't be too long, I don't believe, so maybe 15, 20 minutes. Um, we do have a couple of board items as well. Um, to talk about an executive session. So if you could um, just stick around for a minute, that would be great. Um, we're we'll gonna meet in the band room. Okay, fantastic. So thank you everybody, thank you for coming out. Um, we're gonna meet in the band room. Thank you, thank you for doing the video. I know we kept you a little bit longer. I apologize, but thanks so much. All right. If we can meet um, fairly quickly in the band room, that would be great. I know I'm usually the most tardy, but this is the pot calling the kettle black. <laughs>